refugees uh, who face a lot of uh, uh, issues, um, and also around the health disparities that we encounter within the LGBT community, among other things. Um, and then we do a lot of work um, in education, of course, because we are public health, so we try to uh, use evidence-based practices to educate. Um, and um, anyway, just a couple, those were just kind of introductory remarks. But what I wanted to talk about, this is kind of the intro that um, I like. Dr. Kim is now the president of the World Bank, but he's one of the co-founders of Partners in Health, which many of you might know. Um, the fight against Ebola is a fight against inequality. And I wanted to start with this after seeing Lisa's presentation because I think a lot of times uh, we forget the fact that there are huge inequalities, like you said, uh, between countries. Uh, and being from Eastern Europe, I know very well uh, issues related to infrastructures and corruption. That's the big C uh, that we face even today. Uh, and the fact that it takes us 10 years to do 100 kilometers of highway. Yay. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that, but I think that's really important to start there. And I just want to kind of give a little bit of a background um, for some of you who might not be as um, aware of what we mean by health inequalities. Uh, but what we really mean is, um, our, is systematic differences in the health status of different population groups, right? Um, and health inequalities impact uh, significantly the societies where they happen, and they happen everywhere, obviously, like Lisa said, um, socially and economic. There are social and economic costs both to individuals and societies. Um, and Lisa already introduced us to the idea of to some of the factors, right? We have education, employment, income, gender, ethnicity, and I should add sexual orientation, gender identity, and so on and so forth. Um, and we call these social determinants of health. And um, we, from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we learned that this terminology, social determinants of health, doesn't resonate with anybody. And the way they <laughs> changed it was that uh, they, now they say that social determinants of health is, or health is impacted by where we live, work, uh, play, and in Missouri and in a lot of places, worship, right? That's really important. That's a different community. Um, and, um, and why I'm talking about that and kind of repeating what Lisa said is that World Health Organization um, has started a really powerful initiative, uh, hopefully, we, we hope that at least in Eastern Europe, from my home country and other places around the world, is going to shape, take place and it's going to have positive income, uh, outcomes, um, is uh, what World Health Organization calls health equity in all policies. And um, uh, that comes from the understanding that every aspect of government and the economy has the potential to have affect health and health equity, finance, education, housing, etc. And why is that important? It's because um, all over the world, um, in my country and in Missouri, working here for the last five years, um, is that we see different uh, sectors like finance, education, housing, taking, um, creating policies and implementing policies that ultimately affect health in a negative way. Um, so the World Health Organization is uh, creating this um, uh, initiative and one of the most important things for them is uh, policy coherence, right? That's crucial. And in public health, we believe that too. Uh, it's really important that different government department policies complement each other rather than contradict each other. And I wanted to kind of have an exercise in asking you, I'm sure all of you has, have an idea of, uh, about policies that contradict each other, especially that contradict health policies. But in the interest of time, I won't go there. <laughs> But this is an example, right? Policy that actively encourages the production, um, trade, consumption of high uh, foods that are high in fats and sugars to the detriment of uh, fruit and vegetable production. Um, and that's a contradictory to health policy. And yes. <laughs> um, but the, what's, what happened throughout the past year uh, through the Ebola crisis um, and is that we started to have really meaningful conversations, at least in public health and health policy, and here in, at, in Missouri, at the University of Missouri, around um, the increased attention on local public health departments and their role. And not only that, but uh, the funding that they have available to respond to these types of crises. And Lisa mentioned the number of things that uh, public health folks do around the state and around the country. And she also mentioned that it takes a lot of money to do that. And public health in general, public health departments and state departments and CDC, they have, there's a multitude of funding sources, there's federal sources, state sources, there's grants, right? 
a lot of our colleagues in public health departments write grants and they do a lot of work to survive and to change their communities or to work with their communities to produce change. And I just want to kind of focus and talk a little bit about public health funding, which is really uh, close to our hearts. Um, in 2014, uh, many of you know there's a annual America's Health Rankings, there's an annual report, Missouri ranks 44 um, uh, in the state, uh, in the uh, United States for um, how much funding we have available. And so as you can see in some of these, the average from 2007 to 2013 has been around maybe $45 per person. And then if you look at the national average for, gen for overall public health funding, the average, the same time is probably $85, $90 per person. So we are really uh, probably half, right? And then there's the discussion around state investments in public health, which are really important if we want to think of uh, how prepared public health departments are to take on crises, emerging crises like Ebola or others. Uh, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, it really ranks last uh, when it comes to per capita state uh, public health budget. Right? We, that's not an expense, that's what's budgeted for. So uh, we, uh, we budget for five, a little bit, I mean, close to $6 per person. And um, public health departments are supposed to do a lot of work and budget around that. And this is uh, the example from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report. As you can see, we have states like Hawaii, New York, Alaska, Idaho that spend much, much more, or budget at least, much, much more than public health. The average I didn't include, but it's I think it's around $27 per person. And Missouri is dead last. <laughs> Sorry, last. <laughs> Changing a little bit to federal uh, policy, um, I, I found this in a really wonderful preparedness report. Um, after our conversation on the panel, I really want to showcase that. CDC is doing wonderful work with less and less money. Uh, this is kind of a graphic showing public health emergency preparedness uh, funding available and has been gone down, maybe with one exception in 2006. Um, there's also in this report, there's mention of 48,000 jobs that I think have been lost in public health uh, starting, I think, 2008, but I would have to double check that. Uh, definitely I can share the reference with anybody after this. Um, but again, this shows um, under uh, what pressure our uh, public health uh, systems in the United States are to actually work on emerging crises like this and to do a lot of the work that Lisa mentioned. And again, there's a wonderful organization, National Association of, I think it's uh, city and county health officials. Uh, they produce every year a report around uh, preparedness funding because obviously they lobby for more funding for public health. And uh, uh, this report shows that more than half of the local public health departments have responded uh, to at least one of the all hazards events before in the past, I mean, it's not 2014, it's 2010 to 2013, so it's everything from earthquakes to tornadoes and all others. So the need is there, right? And I just wanted to close with um, um, Dr. Anthony Fauci is uh, the director of the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Disease. And in one of his podcasts with the National Institutes for Health, he talks a lot about the fact that in order to address some of these public health emergency, emergencies, you need sound public, public health practices, like Lisa was saying, uh, engaged communities, uh, and of course, considerable assistance and global solidarity. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is around engaging communities. At the Center for Health Policy, we do a lot of work. And I've heard someone in the panel that everybody called, I think, Dr. Jerry. Uh, they, they mentioned that for the past 20 years, um, the academic community has talked about enga engaging communities. And a lot of times in health and trying to develop educational programs and, um, like, you know, you mentioned a lot of education because we need to do a lot of education. There's no way you can do it successfully without engaging the communities, and we learned really well at the Center for the Policy a lot of times. The program and the education looks, and the outcomes, and you know what you're teaching looks completely different after you engage the community. And definitely you need to make sure you um, account for that in your planning process. With that being said, a lot of times the funders uh, don't necessarily account for that when they write uh, proposals because uh, they need, I think someone else mentioned, um, 
was it short-term thinking, right? In, um, and that also, I think, uh, happens in public health. A lot of times, funding looks at those very short-term uh, outcomes, and then, and really, truly, you don't have the time to engage the community, gain the trust, and implement a program that matches the community's needs in 